Good morning, everybody. <coughs> great to see you. Um, lovely to have you with us, uh, especially if it's your first time. Great to have you with us this morning, and uh, looking forward to worshipping together. And also good to have those with us um, online, isn't it? <coughs> uh, just a reminder, the Holiday Club uh, starts uh, a week Monday, so we're going to pray for that today. Um, we've been praying over the weekend, haven't we, um, for the, the future of the fellowship, so we'll be remembering that. Uh, this evening we have a, a service of communion. We're going to meet on the Lord's table this evening. Um, so you're all invited to come along and share in that if you, if you can. Um, it's not going to be a... It's going to be really focused on the Lord's table. It's to get, the whole thing will surround that. So it's, there's not going to be a long message tonight, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but it will be a time when we can again pray and, and, uh, and spend some time reflecting on what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 134 says this, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. And we're here, aren't we, today to praise the Lord, to uh, give him the glory and the honour. Uh, we're not here for our, our own uh, self-gratification. We're here to praise God and to worship him. This morning. So let's come in prayer as we do come to worship together. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you that we can meet together this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we have the freedom in this country still to gather together for worship. And we thank you for that uh, very special privilege. We know that many of our brothers and sisters around the world don't even have that opportunity to do that. So, Lord, forgive us for taking it for granted. Forgive us for perhaps being a little lackadaisical about it sometimes, but to help us, Lord, to be reminded of the fact that it is a real privilege and joy to meet for worship and to meet with you, the living God. We ask that you'll bless the time that we share together this morning, that our eyes will be focused on Jesus, that our hearts and minds will be full of him, and uh, the Holy Spirit may overshadow us in all that we do here this morning. So we ask your blessing and your encouragement in this time together. In that precious name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. <coughs> So our first uh, song this morning, a lovely hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
have perhaps one sentence prayers of thanks and praise to God. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of the day, for the food that we've eaten, for the sleep that we've had. Now the fellowship and opportunity of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness with us for all generations. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness. We pray and ask to help us to show that to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but forgive us, and <coughs> forgive us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and bring us from thank you. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you for the security and safety that you, you, you give us in this country, mm -hmm. and we just ask you to look on those who have been in need of your protection. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Ten years we sing, ascribe greatness to our God the Rock. Have a seat. <clears throat> I would like us to, uh, to come to a, a time of prayer together now um, and uh, to pray, as, as we said, particularly the things we've been praying for over the weekend uh, for the future of the fellowship, um, for you know, the, the position of, of pastor and for Michael, whether he is the right person uh, to come along, um, to pray for the outreach in the vicinity here, um, the opportunities we have as in the school here to, to do that and to you know, just ask God to lead us and guide us on into the future. Um, I would like to sing one more, I'm going to change the order if I might, and sing Be Still. We'll stay seated and sing Be Still for the presence of the Lord. Um, 
and then we'll just come to time of prayer together. And do feel free to pray as you feel led. But let's stay seated and sing Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Father, we pray that as we now come before you, you would still our hearts and our minds. Help us once again to focus on the Lord Jesus, mm. to be reminded of who he is and all that he's done for us. And as we bring our prayers and our petitions and our thanksgiving before you now, Lord, we pray that it might come with the right attitude, that it might come with a humble heart before our God, seeking to know your direction and your will. So hear us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Crossroads in uh, the life of this church, and we pray, Lord, that you'll guide us clearly, mm. that your spirit might 
work in each each person's heart mm. to know your plan and purpose for the future. Mm. We know, Lord, that um, we don't have uh, the best ideas, and quite often our thoughts are prejudiced. <coughs> we know, Lord, that you are perfect in all your ways and that your judgments are good. So we pray, Lord, uh, concerning Michael, that uh, you'll convict him that he's the right man to come here. Mm. And also convict us in our hearts that he's also your man. Mm. But if not, Lord, then direct us clearly. Show us where we should go, <coughs> whether it's something completely different, or, or we're just looking for guidance. So mm. answer our prayer as you promised in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we do pray for Michael, Lord. We know that he has applied for his position. We know that he's come here twice, Lord. And we know that we need a pastor, Lord. We thank you for Don, Lord, and all his services, Lord. And we know that you are leading him perhaps in a different direction, but we pray for him, that you'll guide and help Amen. him. And we pray <coughs> that you'll help Michael, Lord, as he considers whether this is the place that you want him to be a minister. Mm -hmm. And Lord, if it is, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to recognize that, Lord. And as our brothers just pray, if not, then to just move on, Lord. If, if we both, if, you're, if your answer is no, then that you might Give us a pastor, Lord. We, we need one. We, we want one, Lord. We want to, to listen to your word. We want to be guided by your word. And so we pray and ask that you'll send us the right man, whoever he is, Lord. And that we'll have an answer, Lord. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Mm -hmm. and Amen. Amen. Do you thank you that you've uh, called us to be your children as a witness here in this place. And Lord, we know that each one of us has a, a purpose in your plans. And we pray, Father, that you would guide and direct us as a fellowship, but also as individuals into what you require of us. Lord, we, we look forward to the excitement and anticipation of what you're going to do amongst us, because Lord, you've placed us in this uh, housing estate for a reason. And uh, we just pray, Father, that uh, we might uh, have that eager desire to go out and to share the good news with those people around us. That, Father, you would give us opportunities to speak and to share that gospel message. That we might see you working mightily amongst us through your Holy Spirit. Bringing people in, not just people in to the church for the sake of numbers. We want to see, Lord, people being saved. We want to see souls um, going, uh, heading to glory, Lord. And we pray, Father, you might... Just uh, bless us uh, and, and work amongst us through your Holy Spirit to that end. So Father, we do pray that you might uh, use us as a fellowship and continue to guide and direct us as to the future, Lord. We know we are safe in your hands and we know, Lord, that you will reveal your will to us and we pray, Father, you might take us step by step along that path that you've set for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, if you'd like you to uh, turn with me in your Bibles now, if you've got your Bibles with you, um, to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to read from uh, verse 1. <coughs> Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flock with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, 
And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn <coughs> out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now just turn over to chapter 50 of Genesis, and uh, we're going to read from verse 22 of chapter 50. So this is uh, obviously many years later, and we read, Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110 and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Amen. Well, let's sing one more, then we'll come to look at God's word together. We're going to sing, As the deer pants for the water.
bit rusty with the old singing, aren't we? But we'll, we'll get there. Um, just to let you know, next week we've got Dennis and Sheila um, Eaton coming to speak in the morning. Dennis is going to speak, and it's always lovely to have them with us. Uh, and they'll probably give us an update on the work in Malawi as well. So that's next Sunday morning. If you can join with us there, that would be great. Let's pray as we come to God's word this morning. Let's pray. Father, once again, as we come to your word this morning, we would ask that uh, you might speak to us through it, that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds and help us to have ears that are ready to hear. And we pray, Father, that we would be eager to listen to what you would say to us, but also, Lord, help us to uh, examine the scriptures to make sure that what we're hearing is right. And help us, Lord, then to apply it to the way that we live day by day. So speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going through um, some of the Bible stories, aren't we, that maybe we uh, teach our children. And sometimes we perhaps lose sight of uh, the, the, the real meaning of some of these stories, or perhaps we see these stories as nothing more than uh, pictures or allegory um, uh, uh, for a, a message that God wants to give us. And so we've been think, considering whether these stories are, have a basis in fact. Are they real or are they some uh, just uh, allegorical uh, fantasy? We've thought about the story of Adam and Eve, and we saw there, didn't we? The Bible clearly teaches Adam and Eve were real people. And uh, as we look through the creation account, we realise that it's a, it's a historical account. It's not supposed to be a picture language. It's meant to be read as reality. And uh, Adam and Eve were indeed real people. We looked at the story of Noah and the flood. And again, seeing the reality of the, event, the, the, the events surrounding the flood, uh, evidence of which is all around us today, if we care to look at it. The flood brought judgment on mankind. But also it brought the promise, didn't it, that God would never flood the whole world ever again. Um, that's why he set the, the rainbow in the sky. And the next judgment that we face will be the final one, the day of judgment. And last time we looked at the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And we realised, even though this is quite a short uh, passage in the scripture, uh, this is a pivotal event in human history. Uh, because of man's failure, once again, to be obedient to God, because of man's selfish ambition and pride, that caused a separation between peoples, which is uh, still there today, of course, results in wars and disputes and arguments and all sorts of things, because sin always separates. But God, in his great mercy, I didn't want to leave it there, did he? He provides a way back um, from that separation from sin. And Babel reminds us that in order to put things right, God came down. God came down to earth to restore that which was broken. And by trusting in him, not only do we restore the relationship between ourselves and God, we also restore the relationships between one another. Well, this week we're looking at the story of Joseph and his coat of many colours. Now, believe it or not, there are many people who doubt the veracity of this story, or at least parts of it. People very often suggest that at the very least it's exaggerated or an enhanced version of what really happened, just to make a point. So is this true? Can we trust the reliability of what we read about Joseph? Or again, is it a made-up story to teach us some theological lesson? Well, it's going to come as no surprise to you, I'm sure, that I'm going to tell you that it's real, that this is something we can trust in, and we're going to look at why we can do it. Let's have a look. Let's just remind ourselves a bit of, of Joseph's story, shall we? I think the first thing that we should note is this is a very detailed story. It covers 14 chapters in Genesis. And that's rather a lot of detail, I think, for somebody to make up just to make an illustration. Um, it, it details his life right the way through until his death and in great detail. And so it's, a, it's a quite a, a comprehensive story. Joseph, um, as I'm sure you know, was the second youngest son of Jacob. Benjamin was the youngest. They were the two sons of Jacob's favoured wife, Rachel. You remember, he wanted to marry Rachel uh, first of all, but he ended up having to marry uh, 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 Leah. Leah. Thank you. I, I, it was coming to me eventually. Leah. And of course, he had um, some concubines as well who produced some of his other children. But Rachel was his favoured wife, and Joseph and Benjamin were his favoured sons, and out of the two of them, Joseph was the most favoured. Well, we meet this uh, young man, Joseph, at the age of 17 in Genesis 37, verse 3 and 4, and it reads, it says this, 
Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had borne to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe, ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And that sets the scene. In many ways, that tells us all we need to know about the situation we find ourselves here uh, with Joseph as a young man. <coughs> Joseph was a bit of a brash teenager. Uh, God gave him some dreams. And in, in these dreams, his brothers and in fact his, his whole family bowed down to him. And God was saying to Joseph uh, in those dreams, this is what's going to happen. And of course, Joseph, being the, the, the teenager he was, rushed out and told them all about it. He wanted them to know this is what's going to happen. And of course, it, it didn't get a very favourable reaction, did it? And I, I can think we can all, all understand probably why that was. And of course, the result is I'm sure you know all about Joseph's life from then on in. His brothers uh, um, took the opportunity to uh, sell him into slavery. Um, they were going to kill him, but uh, Reuben, one of the brothers, stopped them and said, let's just sell him into slavery. So he was sold off to some traders who were heading down to Egypt, and they told their father. They took his coat, the, the richly uh, ornamented coat, and they put blood on it, and they said that uh, Joseph had been killed by a wild animal, and that's what they told their father. But they sold him into slavery, and he ends up in Potiphar's house, doesn't he? Um, and he, uh, we read in Genesis 39, verse 4, Joseph found favour in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. See, Joseph still trusted in God, and he worked hard, and he did everything he should do, even as a slave, and he worked his way up in Potiphar's house to the point of becoming in charge of everything Potiphar owned. But of course... He was a handsome young man, Joseph, a bit like some of us. And uh, uh, Potiphar's wife took a, a liking to him, shall we say. And, uh, uh, and she tried to seduce him. And of course, Joseph, who still was trusting in God, uh, turned her down, refused, and uh, uh, basically ran for his life. And of course, she took offence at this and told Potiphar that he'd molested her. And basically, Joseph was then thrown into prison, wasn't he, as a result of that, unjustly sent into prison. Um, but again, we read in Genesis 39, verses 20 to 23, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warder. So the warder put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warder paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. So there we have Joseph again becoming trusted and becoming in charge effectively of the prison under the warder. He was the, the, the top man in the prison and he was put in charge of all the people there. And he comes across, doesn't he, the cupbearer and the baker. He met um, these two guys in prison and he told them what their dreams meant, and it ended up that the baker was going to be executed, but the cupbearer will be restored to his original position. And Joseph says to the cupbearer, when you go back to Pharaoh, just remember me. And of course, the cupbearer went back to Pharaoh and completely forgot all about him, and Joseph stayed in prison. The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. And again, it was... Uh, years later that uh, Pharaoh has some dreams and then the cupbearer remembers Joseph. I know somebody who can tell you about those dreams, he said, this guy in prison. So Joseph is summoned to Pharaoh and uh, uh, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. He says there's a famine coming, there's going to be some years of plenty, we need to stock up and, uh, and then there will be a famine throughout the whole region and we'll be able to survive because we've made provision for it. And so Pharaoh um, uh, he's very pleased with what Joseph has told him. And, he, and Pharaoh says to Joseph in Genesis 41, verse 39, he says, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. So he's gone. 
from being in charge of some sheep with his brothers, in charge of Potiphar's household, in charge of the prison, now he's in charge of Egypt. That's how God has worked in the life of Joseph. This brash young teenager, who was not very wise in some of the things he said early on in life, has now become a wise and successful man. The vizier in Egypt. The one, in, in many ways, the most powerful man in Egypt. And then his brothers come to Egypt, don't they? The famine kicks in, they've got no food, they hear this food in Egypt, they go to Egypt to see if they can find some food. They didn't recognise Joseph when they got there, um, but he recognised them. And of course this, this, uh, this situation ensues where Joseph wants to let them know who he is, but won't at the moment. And, and ultimately, he asks them to bring Benjamin next time they come, his, his youngest and f- his favourite brother. Um, and uh, the, a whole situation, as I'm sure you know, ensues where uh, Benjamin comes, Joseph plants a silver cup in his bag, he's then arrested, and they go back to the father and say that uh, Benjamin's been arrested. And anyway, the whole family come to Egypt as a result, the whole family. In Genesis 46, 26, all those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. So the whole family has now arrived in Egypt and there they're looked after. They prosper. Joseph continues to grow in stature and influence. And we read about the sons he has. He has sons uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. And they become the half-tribes of Israel. If you've ever wondered why um, Joseph is not one of the tribes of Israel, it's because his sons make up the tribes. They are called the half-tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. So you, you, when you read through the Bible and you come across the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, they are the sons of, ja- of Joseph. And that's why uh, there's no tribe of Joseph. Well, eventually Jacob dies and... Uh, and at, during that time, of course, his, his brothers get a bit worried. You know, when their father dies, is Joseph going to then turn on them? But no, he says to them, no, it's not going to happen. He says, I'm going to, you're forgiven. And he says this in Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And there we see, if you like, in, in almost the culmination of what God was doing in Joseph's life. He put him in that position He put him through everything he went through to make sure he went in that position and saved the lives of Jacob's family, the nation of Israel, as it would become. And then at the end of Genesis, we come to the death of Joseph himself. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land, to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110 and after they had embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. That's the story. Familiar to most of you, I'm sure. What about the coat though? The coat is, um, you know, very prominent in most of the the stories we hear of Joseph, isn't it? And... uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber has made a fair bit of money based on the musical, based on this coat, or based on the starring role the coat has. But actually, it doesn't play much of a part in the story, does it? Overall, out of those 14 chapters we read, it's only just there at the beginning, really. But what does the coat mean? You know, the most common sort of outer garment they had in those days was was nothing more really than a long cloth with a hole in the middle to stick your head through, and you'd stick your head through it, and then you'd put a belt round it, and that was your coat. That's what most people had. Well, this was a special kind of coat. We don't know what it really looked like, but we know it was special because we read again, don't we, Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. It's a very special coat. Colourful and decorative. And colourful and decorative garments were usually a symbol of status in those days. And maybe this is a prophetic indication of what was to come that Joseph was going to have status and be special. And that's what the coat retells us. Because the real issue has nothing to do with the colours, whether it was multicoloured or whatever. Jacob gave this coat as Joseph, to Joseph as a sign that Joseph was esteemed above his brothers. In essence, 
He was saying, you are my choice as the future head of this family. Jacob's successor, that's who he was going to be. An honour, of course, normally bestowed on the firstborn son, but not this time. No wonder his brothers didn't really like him, is it, at that time? So is this a true story? Is there anything that we can look at that tells us uh, the validity of what went on in, in this time? Is there any archaeological evidence to suggest that this man Joseph existed? Um, sorry, I'm behind there, aren't I? Uh, there's nothing in the Egyptian records that speak of a man named Joseph. There's no record of him in that sense. But of course that doesn't preclude him from being there. Pharaoh gave him an Egyptian name to start with. Genesis 41 verse 45. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphineth, Panea, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. But there are many intriguing things throughout Egyptian history that coincide with the story of Joseph. For example, there is evidence of the drought. Um, in that region, there, there is evidence in, in the geology and in, in the uh, fossilised records that there was a drought at that time. Uh, it, right, right at the time the Bible says there was this famine in the land. Um, and, you know, furthermore, one of the most fertile areas in Egypt is, is, the land, is the land around the Lake Quran. And this lake was fed with water from one of the Nile deltas, or branches of the Nile. And uh, droughts in Egypt used to cause this to dry up leaving uh, the lake barren. And we do know that between 1850 BC and 1650 BC, at some point, a canal was built to keep this lake permanently filled up so that the land would remain fertile. And that canal was so effective, it's still in use today. There's no record of who built it, but for thousands of years it has been known by the name in Arabic as Bar Yusef. And that translates as the waterway of Joseph. That's the name of this canal. Also, uh, at the site of modern-day Tel El Ed Daba, archaeologists have remain, unearthed the remains of a palace and gardens that was built at the time of Joseph. And there's a tomb. And it's generally accepted that this must have been the home of somebody who was important in Egypt. And actually, in the spring of 1987, there was an archaeological dig in the gardens of this palace, and that's where they discovered this tomb. And here, the remnants of a statue were found which depicted a man of great importance, although he wasn't Egyptian. It's clear that he was a foreigner. And the statue shows him with this insignia of high office, but also uh, some items which show he was foreign. Not only that, but he's wearing a garment which consisted of many colours. And I quote um, from a book by David Roll called uh, uh, The Test of Time. He says he's, he's an Egyptologist and... Uh, um, He's right. He says this, wrapped around the Asiatic official, enveloping all but his head, neck, arms and feet, is a wondrous coat of many colours. The rich reds and blues are trimmed with black and white to produce a simple but effective geometric pattern of stripes and rectangles, similar to the costumes worn by Asiatics, represented in the tomb of, whatever that name is, at Bayed Hassan. The effect, he says, is dazzling. And this is a reconstruction of that statue that was found in that tomb. David Roll, in his book, A Test of Time, concludes this could be none other than the biblical Joseph. And this was his tomb. And just in case you're still a little bit uncertain, let me tell you this. The tomb was empty. When it was discovered, it was found to be empty. It hadn't been ransacked. It hadn't been plundered by thieves, as most other tombs were. It appears that the tomb had been carefully emptied. There was no mummy or bones remaining. Other tombs were found nearby with skeletal remains in them, but not this one. And we know, don't we, that when the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they took the bones of Joseph with them. So there we have it. This could be the very tomb of Joseph. And of course, none of this proves that this was Joseph. But I think the evidence is quite compelling. But there are lessons we can learn from the life of Joseph. This real man who existed and did everything the Bible tells us he did. And there are lessons we can learn, because Joseph is seen to be a picture of Christ. He was hated and rejected by his brothers, in the same way the Jews hated and rejected Jesus. He was stripped and beaten. 
He was sold for silver. He was favoured by God. He resisted temptation. He was condemned with two criminals, one who was given life, the other who was executed and condemned. He was made a ruler and he saved his people. You see, in the life picture of Joseph, we see clearly a picture of the Messiah that would come and what would happen. But there's more than that in the life of Joseph because the life of Joseph also gives us a picture of the life of a believer and the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying the believer. Joseph starts off as a brash young man, doesn't he? That's how he starts off. He thinks he knows it all. He thinks he's, he's got it all sussed. And, and maybe sometimes we're a bit like that when we become Christians. We think we've got it all sussed. But the circumstances of his life moulded him into be the man God wanted him to be. God dictated his circumstances so that he was moulded into the person God wanted him to be. Every event in his life makes him who he is and ultimately prepares him for the job that God has for him. Every time he is given some responsibility, he's given a bit more and a bit more and a bit more until he comes to the point where he's in charge of Egypt, the place God wanted him to be for a very special reason. Each time he's knocked down, he gets up and he's stronger. He's, his faith in God is constant and remains and grows and grows throughout that time. God is gracious with Joseph and gradually changes this brash teenager into a wise ruler. That's what God does with all of us in one way or another. He takes the raw person we are when we become believers and he gradually changes us into the people he wants us to be. That's the work of the Spirit. That's the sanctifying work of God's Spirit. But one more thing I'd like us to take away from the life of Joseph. He was flawed, but faithful. He was flawed, but faithful. And that gives me some real encouragement, because I know I've got plenty of flaws. Joseph was a man like you and me. He had plenty of flaws, but he remained faithful to God throughout his life, and God used him in wonderful ways, didn't he? I've often wondered, as I've read the story of Joseph, what he was thinking as he met each trial. I mean, he had that dream at the age of 17, all those dreams. God had promised him, didn't he, that he would be a great leader to whom his whole family would one day bow down. What's he thinking when he's sold into slavery? What's going on here? What's he thinking when he's shoved into prison? Why is this happening? What's he thinking when the cupbearer promises to t talk to Pharaoh about him and then forgets all about him? What's he thinking when he goes to the palace of Pharaoh and is eventually made the vizier? He sees, doesn't he, he looks back, God's hand through it all. He sees God working through his whole life to fulfill the dream that God had given him. The dreams he had as a teenager are fulfilled. His family come and they bow down to him in the position that God has placed him in. You see, God kept his promise. God kept his promise to Joseph and God keeps his promises to us. Joseph remained faithful because God was working in him and through him by his Holy Spirit throughout his life. He was sanctifying Joseph and he does the same to all of his children. He sanctifies each one of us. I think this is one of my favourite stories in Scripture. Because we see God's hand at work in ways that Joseph couldn't at the time. We see God working in wonderful ways through every moment of Joseph's life. If he hadn't been sold into slavery in Egypt, the nation of Israel would never have come into existence as they did. Because God took them to Egypt and under his protection, that family grew into a great nation. And of course, when time came to leave, circumstances changed. A pharaoh arose who didn't know Joseph, we're told. And the Israelites themselves were enslaved, but that's another story. God used Joseph 
to fulfill his plans and purposes in wonderful and miraculous ways. Because of what Joseph went through, the nation of Israel came into being. And they moved on, didn't they? As we will see in weeks ahead. But what I want us to learn from this is this. God works in us and through us exactly the same way as he worked through Joseph. Joseph was not special. Cope was special. Joseph wasn't. Joseph was somebody who was simply used by God in God's service. A man who was flawed and yet faithful. And God can work through each one of us in exactly the same way. We're all flawed, but we can all be faithful. He will sanctify us. He will make us the people he wants us to be. Even though we might not understand the trials we face, God's purpose is always being worked out. And he is moulding us into the people he wants us to be. The people he can use in his service for the good of his people. Not for our good, for the good of his people. Joseph did not have a technicolour dream coat, but a promise from God. And God made Joseph the man he became. I want to leave the last word this morning with John Owen, who says this about sanctification. Christians can be confident about their growth in sanctification and eternal security because they are confident in the God who promises it. He promised it to Joseph, He's promised it to us, and he always fulfills his promises. Let's pray. Father, we want to just give you thanks for this story of Joseph, Lord, and for uh, the many, many lessons we can learn from. Lord, we've just touched the surface of it this morning, but we just thank you, Lord, that there are many things that we can learn. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that we do learn through it that you are a faithful God, a God who always keeps his promises. A God who directs and uh, guides his people through situations and circumstances. Sometimes that we can't see where we're going, but we thank you that you know where we're going and you're leading and guiding us. And we have that confidence here as a fellowship, Lord, not just as individuals, but also we know that you will lead and guide us as a fellowship and you will fulfill the promises that you've made in your word to us. And we give you thanks for that. So we ask your continued blessing. Help us to dwell upon these things, to perhaps read that story again for ourselves, to learn more lessons from it, and to just take to heart what you would teach us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to close uh, this morning by singing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
evening. Come around the Lord's table if you possibly can. It'd be great to share in fellowship there. But let's uh, close by saying the words of the grace together, shall we? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.